Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash onceuponacrime. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, including true crime books. And this week's suggestion comes from a listener, Jessica Martinez. The book is Devil's Knot, The True Story of the West Memphis Three by Mara Leverett. In 1993, three eight-year-old boys were found murdered in West Memphis, Arkansas. Later, three local teens, alleged to be members of a satanic cult, would be charged with the crime. Despite stunning investigative blunders, a confession riddled with errors, and an absence of physical evidence linking any of the accused to the crime, they would be tried and convicted. Two were sentenced to life in prison and one to death. In Devil's Knot, the award-winning journalist Mara Leverett provides us the most comprehensive look into this fascinating case. So go to audibletrial.com slash onceuponacrime for your free audiobook and a 30-day free trial. And thank you, Jessica, for the terrific recommendation. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series True Crime Game Changers. Each episode, I discuss a crime that made us rethink or change the way we respond to crime. This is our last chapter of the series. In this episode, I'll talk about what happens when the victim of the crime is a child. We as a society view this as the most heinous type of crime, and it often spurs law enforcement, parents, and community members to quickly call for changes to protect our children. This is what happened in 1996 in a town in Texas when a nine-year-old child went missing. This is Chapter 4, Amber Hagerman and the Amber Alert. Donna Whitson was a single mother of two, nine-year-old Amber and five-year-old Ricky. Amber was born when Donna was just 19 years old. Amber's father, Richard, was 36. Donna and Richard never married and now lived apart. Donna had left school after the seventh grade. As she became a mother, she realized the value of education. She now struggled as a single parent on welfare. She stressed the importance of school to her children, and Amber especially loved school. She got high marks and earned perfect attendance awards. Donna had gone back to school to work towards a better future for her children. She had completed classes to receive her general equivalency diploma and was now taking job training classes to become a medical assistant. Donna had been interviewed for a series on welfare reform for her local news station, WFAA, out of Dallas, Texas. The news story followed the young mother raising two children on welfare and reported on her financial struggles and her victories along the way to complete her education and train for a job. After completing these goals, Donna hoped that she could get off of government assistance. Donna and her children lived in Arlington, located in North Texas, almost directly in between the two larger cities of Dallas and Fort Worth. Donna's parents, Jimmy and Glenda Whitson, also lived in Arlington, and Amber and Ricky were very close to their grandparents. They would often spend time with their mother at their grandparents' house. Their grandfather, Jimmy, enjoyed woodworking and would build furniture and toys for his grandchildren. Glenda was a loving grandma who doted on her grandchildren. When Amber was born on November 25, 1986, Glenda was thrilled to have a grandbaby, especially a girl that she could spoil. They, like Donna, lived on a fixed income, but they did whatever they could to make their grandchildren happy. Amber loved to go to her grandma's house and climb the big tree in her yard. The children kept their bicycles at the Whitson's house and loved to ride them around the neighborhood. On Saturday, January 13, 1996, Amber and Ricky went with Donna to their grandparents' house. They quickly retrieved their bicycles from the porch and got permission to ride around the block. It was 3.10 p.m. Less than 10 minutes later, Ricky returned to the house alone. Having disobeyed not to go farther than around the block, Amber rode her bike to the parking lot of a nearby abandoned Winn-Dixie grocery store. Ricky, afraid of getting in trouble, rode home while Amber stayed and was riding her bike in the parking lot when he left. A man who lived adjacent to the parking lot heard Amber yelling and looked up to see a man grab the girl and put her in the cab of a black pickup truck. The man in the truck drove off, and the neighbor called 911. Arlington 911, what are you reporting? Yeah, I, I saw a, a 
black pickup and he grabbed the little girl and he took off toward town with her. Uh-huh. And she hollered. While I was talking to the policeman, her granddad drove up. And so then I went back and told Donna that somebody had got Amber. Of course, my dad had his serious face on. I knew he was not messing with me. I knew he was telling me the truth. I just went crazy then. I just started going towards where my father said she was abducted at, screaming her name, but maybe for sure she would answer me. The police arrived and began combing the area. Amber's family quickly put together a flyer with her picture, and neighbors began to distribute them. The media got wind of the abduction of the little girl and began to show up at the Whitsons' home. Her grandfather thought that the media could get Amber's picture out to the public faster, so they granted them an interview. Donna made a tearful plea to the kidnapper. I beg you, don't hurt my little girl. Richard Hagerman, Amber's father, couldn't believe that Amber had really been abducted when he heard the news. But he quickly had to face reality when he arrived to throngs of police officers and media camped outside of the Whitsons' home. He called Mark Klass of the Polly Klass Foundation to ask for help. Mark advised him to call the FBI immediately and also to get word out to the media as far and wide as possible and as quickly as possible. But the media had more than a school picture on a flyer to help them get Amber's story out. Because of the video footage they had about Donna and her family, they had hours of videotapes of Amber that they could play on news reports. Footage of Amber at her recent ninth birthday party and videos of her showing her scrapbook of medals and awards from school, the public was able to see Amber as a sweet, lively young girl she was, and hundreds of people rallied quickly to find her and bring her home. On a personal note, I watched the news footage of Amber and her family while researching this case. Of course, I remember the famous picture from her missing flyer, a cute little freckle-faced girl with brown hair, her face framed by bangs. But these videos really made me see what a sweet, lovely child she was. The video shows Amber's mom, Donna, trying to make ends meet on government assistance. She is putting together Amber's ninth birthday party and really wants to get her a nice present. She's so proud of Amber because she's such a good girl and she works so hard in school. She really wanted to be able to provide her with a special reward that she could present her at her birthday party. So in this clip, she goes to Walmart and makes some purchases. But at important times, Donna sacrificed and splurged. Three weeks before Amber's birthday, she made the final payment on a present, a t-shirt, leggings, socks, doll accessories, and Pocahontas sheets. This here came to $40, and, which ain't much, but it's all I could afford for. Later, we see Amber at her birthday party in a blue polka dotted dress, opening her presents. It's heavy. Sounds for mommy. The gifts from her mother, especially the Pocahontas sheets, oh, brought a priceless oh, reaction. Turn it around and see what it is. Oh, oh. When I saw her wide-eyed pleasure at opening up a gift as simple and practical as a set of bed sheets with Pocahontas on them, I lost it. Such a sweet little girl. She loved her family so much and was so grateful for the small gifts they could give her. Her grandparents were so kind and loving as well. She was truly a lucky little girl and they cherished her dearly. Which makes the ending of this story even more tragic, if that's even possible. The police and the FBI undertook a wide-reaching search for the little girl, but to no avail. The only witness was the neighbor who'd called 911. He said the abductor was a white or Hispanic man who pulled Amber off her bike, put her in a black truck, and drove off. There was no other clues, no fingerprints on the bicycle, and no other evidence left behind. Four days later, a man walking his dog behind the apartment complex where he lived saw a body lying face down in the creek bed. The police were called. Amber's family waited two hours before being told that the body was that of their child. She was found only four miles from where she was abducted. Investigators would later determine that she may have been kept alive up to 48 hours. She had been sexually assaulted and her throat had been cut. Police investigators continued to search for the killer. But day after day, Amber's family had no resolution to who had taken and killed their little girl. They kept busy with what they could do to try and deal with their enormous loss. 
Amber's grandfather, who had stopped woodworking after Amber's death, now decided to get back in his shop to create a memorial cross that was placed near the location where Amber was found. The community needed a place to grieve for and remember Amber. He painted the cross pink and marked the words, God's angel, and we love you, Amber. Donna kept Amber's room untouched for several months, but she finally had to put her things away. Every time she would walk into the room and see Amber's toys that lay unused, the grief would hit her all over again. She boxed up Amber's toys and clothes and even her beloved stuffed animals and the Pocahontas sheet set that she'd loved so much. Donna had received hundreds of stuffed animals that people had sent in Amber's memory. She collected them all and donated them to the Arlington Women's Shelter. She turned Amber's bedroom into Ricky's room now. He had been sharing a room with Donna. As bad as some days were for Donna, she was determined to keep going and make a normal life for Ricky. Ricky was having some trouble at home. He seemed to not know how to handle Amber's loss and started acting out, disobeying both his mom and his grandparents. Donna was finally able to get him to talk to her, and he told her that he thought it was his fault that Amber was gone. He should have been watching her, he said. His mom had always said that they were to watch out for each other. Her five-year-old boy was taking the blame for the actions of the monster that had killed his sister. Donna explained to him very clearly that it was not his fault. It was not Amber's fault either. The only one to blame was the bad person who had hurt Amber. It seemed to calm Ricky somewhat. She only wished she could tell him that the bad man had been caught and was behind bars, but it was not to be. Police still had no good leads on a suspect, nor would they. As of today, almost 21 years later, no one has been charged with the kidnapping and murder of Amber Hagerman. But Amber's family was determined that her death would not be in vain. They first started to question why parents weren't informed about sex offenders living near their homes and schools. The community was also, understandably, frightened and angry that this could have happened to one of their own children. They no longer felt safe. They began to ask questions as well. How do we keep our children safe, they wanted to know. Donna and Amber's father, Richard, began to ask officials to enact a one-strike-you're-out policy for sex offenders. Later, with their congressperson, Martin Frost, they traveled to Washington, D.C. to testify before the Congressional Subcommittee on Crime. Frost wanted to get Congress to act on a plan he was proposing to create a nationwide system to track sex offenders. He drafted the Amber Hagerman Child Protection Act with the help of Mark Klass. Bill Clinton signed the Sex Offender Act in October of that year. Richard and Donna were invited to the ceremony at the White House. Back in Arlington, C.J. Wheeler, a reporter from the local radio station KRLD, met with the Dallas police chief, and together they launched the first ever Amber Alert. Amber stood for America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. It was to be used to broadcast information quickly when a child was feared to be abducted. Other states and communities began setting up their own Amber Alert plans as the idea was adopted across the nation. In 1998, the Child Alert Foundation created the first fully automated alert notification system to notify surrounding communities when a child was reported abducted or missing. Alerts were sent to radio stations, television stations, law enforcement agencies, newspapers, and local support agencies. Alerts were also sent all at once to pagers, faxes, emails, and cell phones, with the information immediately posted on the Internet for the general public. In 2000, the U.S. House of Representatives adopted House Resolution 605, encouraging communities nationwide to implement an Amber Alert plan. In 2002, the Federal Communications Commission officially endorsed the system. The kidnapping and murder of Samantha Runyon, a five-year-old girl who'd been snatched by a stranger from her front yard, prompted California to establish an Amber Alert system put in place on July 24, 2002. In its first month of operation in California, there were 13 Amber Alerts with 12 of the children recovered safely and one being a false alarm. In a 2002 conference on missing and exploited children, President George Bush announced changes to the Amber Alert system, including the development of a national standard for Amber Alerts. 
the federal government also provided $25 million in matching grants for states to establish programs and for equipment like electronic highway signs. In 2003, President Bush signed into law the PROTECT Act, which comprehensively strengthened law enforcement's ability to prevent, investigate, prosecute, and punish violent crimes committed against children. By 2005, all states in the U.S. had operational programs. Also in that year, the Department of Justice launched an initiative to train child abduction response teams nationwide to assist local law enforcement agencies responding to incidents of missing and abducted children. They can be used for all missing child cases. By 2009, all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands all had Amber Alert plans. The Amber Alert system has also been adopted in Canada, Mexico, France, the UK, Australia, and other countries around the world that have implemented their own versions of this plan. As of January 1, 2013, alerts began to be sent automatically through the Wireless Emergency Alerts Program. Law enforcement officers know that when children are abducted by strangers, 75% are killed within the first three hours. Time is of the essence. The Amber Alert system gets information out immediately through many different means, including radio, television, social media, internet news, electronic road signs, and wireless carriers. Alerts are sent to not only law enforcement and emergency organizations, but to the general public as well. Now the public can serve as the eyes and ears of law enforcement, and this has led to, as of this year, over 800 safe recoveries of children who are missing or abducted. To give you a sense of the numbers, the 2014 Amber Alert report stated that in that year, 186 Amber Alerts were issued in the United States. This encompassed 239 children, of which 60, or 25%, were taken by strangers or people other than their legal guardians. Here are some cases where the Amber Alert led to the safe recovery of children. On February 27th of this year, in Wolf Point, Montana, a five-year-old girl was abducted from a yard by a man who then fled on foot. Multiple law enforcement agencies came together for a search and rescue effort, and an Amber Alert was activated. Law enforcement received information about the abductor's location from tips generated by the Amber Alert, leading to his apprehension. The child was not with the abductor, but the abductor later confessed to where he had left the child the child was located alive and rescued. Last year in Texas, a six-year-old girl went missing from her home in the middle of the night. The child was last seen in bed, but when the family checked on her, she was gone. A male acquaintance staying with them was also missing, along with the family's van. An Amber Alert was activated, including the use of cell phone messages via wireless emergency alerts with the description and license plate for the vehicle. A clerk at a gas station saw the alert and recognized the vehicle, along with a suspicious man and a girl he claimed was his daughter. This information enabled police to focus their search efforts and locate the vehicle. The child was safely recovered, and the abductor was arrested. Also last year in Utah, a two-year-old girl was abducted when the vehicle she was in was stolen, resulting in the activation of an Amber Alert. A business owner who received the Amber Alert on her cell phone via wireless emergency alerts, noticed a similar vehicle parked outside and determined the license plate matched. When she approached the vehicle, she found the child crying inside and comforted the child until police arrived. The abductor's associates also heard the Amber Alert and convinced the abductor to turn herself in. Many times, just knowing that the Amber Alert has been activated causes the perpetrator to release the child or flee so that the child can be rescued. In one of these cases in California, a 10-month-old baby was forcibly abducted by his father from his ex-wife's home. In addition, the father's criminal history created added concern for the child's safety, resulting in the activation of an Amber Alert. Upon hearing the Amber Alert, the abductor fled from his girlfriend's home and left the child behind. The girlfriend contacted law enforcement and the child was safely recovered. There are also many, many cases where non-custodial parents abduct a child And while some don't believe this to be as serious as a stranger abduction, law enforcement knows that these kinds of cases can be just as dangerous or tragic. These parents can be desperate enough to harm themselves and their child 
and some of them have violent histories or histories of mental illness or drug abuse, which caused them to lose custody of their children. The Amber Alert program works to keep children safe in all instances, even when the danger comes from a parent. The investigation into Amber Hagerman's murder is still ongoing 21 years later. Detective Ben Lopez of the Arlington PD is still assigned to the active case. He inherited the case in 2010 when Jim Ford, the original lead investigator, retired. Lopez was a rookie patrolman in 1996 when Amber was abducted. Over 7,000 leads have been investigated, with two or three still trickling in each month that are followed up on. Amber's case file takes up 54 cardboard boxes at the Arlington Police Department, but they have little concrete evidence to go on, save the only eyewitness account, that of Jimmy Kevill, the man who saw Amber taken, kicking and screaming from the parking lot, located at East Abrams Street and Browning Drive. He identified the abductor as a white Hispanic male, aged 25 to 40, under 6 feet tall, with a medium build. He drove a late 1980s or early 1990s full-size American-made black truck. Lopez believes that someone might know something that can still help crack the case. Maybe the killer made a statement to someone over the years, and maybe that person didn't believe him. Or maybe they think what they know is too insignificant to be helpful. But sometimes it is the small details that can unravel a mystery. If you think you might have information that would be helpful you can contact Detective Lopez at area code 817-459-5373. Or maybe someone knows something about the person who took Amber that day, and they're afraid to come forward for some reason. Detective Lopez wants them to know that they can report the tip anonymously by calling the Tarrant County Crime Stoppers at area code 817-469-TIPS. There is still a $10,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest and conviction. The family has not given up hope of finding the person responsible for Amber's death. January of this year marked the 20-year anniversary of Amber's abduction. The Texas governor declared January 13th as Amber Alert Awareness Day. A mural dedicated to Amber's memory has long stood at the parking lot where Amber was taken. It is captioned, Arlington's Little Angel, with Amber's name flanked by two angel wings. Donna Whitson is now Donna Williams. She has persevered, but life has been difficult. She's had moments of happiness, she says, but feels like she shouldn't be happy. Counseling has helped, but she's had other setbacks as well. Two months after Amber's death, Donna's fiancé died in a car accident. She married in 2000, but her husband died nine years later of a heart attack. Her father, Jimmy, died of cancer that year as well, and her older sister died at age 32 of an illness. Donna is a survivor of a life full of tragedy, but she still works to help keep other children safe. She says her son, Ricky, now 25, keeps her going. It took him almost 15 years before he could talk openly with his mother about the loss of his big sister. He spoke at a press conference on the 20th anniversary of Amber's death. She was like my second mom, he remembers. Every day she's on my mind. He is doing well now and is close with his mother and his grandmother. Donna Williams says of the Amber Alert system named after her daughter, Amber would be very proud of the program, but I also want people to remember that Amber sacrificed her life for it, and I don't want anyone to forget her. This episode is a little shorter than most of my other episodes. The reason for this is that there was no resolution to Amber's murder. No suspect was ever arrested, so there was no trial or conviction. I normally don't talk about unsolved cases. I consider myself, more than anything, to be a storyteller. My stories just happen to be about true crime. As a storyteller, I like relating a beginning, middle, and end for my listeners. But in this case, there is no end at least not yet. So it's a bit unsatisfying to me to not be able to provide you with that information. But I felt this case was important to cover in this series because the outcome was such a big game changer and helped so many other missing and abducted children to be saved. I've also shared some resources and tips for keeping your kids safe 
on the show page at truecrimepodcast.com. So I hope you'll forgive me just this one time for not having an ending to Amber's story. Hopefully in the future there will be one. But if you are interested in unsolved crimes, I can point you to some great true crime podcasts that focus on these types of cases. Check out Unsolved Podcast, The Vanished, and Already Gone. That's it for this episode and this series of Once Upon a Crime. We're right in the middle of the holiday season. It's only a few weeks until Christmas. With that in mind, our next series will be holiday-themed, with a true crime focus, of course. The next series is Holiday Homicides. I know you won't want to miss that, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. You can connect with me on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>